Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings now through the uh, deathbed edition of All Women's Leaves of Grass. We turn now in the section called Children of Adam to a very strange little poem, O Hymen, O Hymene. Now, uh, we've, got to, we've got to try and figure out exactly what's going on in this little poem. This is the kind of poem that some readers of Leaves of Grass will say, see, there's some weak poems in, in Leaves of Grass, and this is a classic example of that. I think, however, Whitman is doing some very interesting and creative things even in a poem like this, so we'll enjoy it, I hope. Now, the assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net from the inscriptions all the way through to the last poem that we just covered, we to how long we were fooled. Uh, uh, you're going to hear a lot of echoes in these final little poems from Children of Adam. Now, let's go to some quick background information because uh, Norton's will tell us it's significant that this poem, Hymen, Hymene, um, was actually the number 13 of the original Children of Adam, and, and in 1860, um, taking its present title in 1867. The title and the substance of the poem may have been suggested to Whitman by a passage in a novel that he loved by George Sand, the Countess of Rodestad, um, a novel that he thought of as a masterpiece, okay? And then there's, uh, there's a lot of scholars that like to then try to figure out what exactly is going on. Well, there is an invocation here, no question, to Hymen, the Greek goddess of marriage. And in some ways, this phrase, Hymene, is, is, is kind of almost a creation of Whitman, but it's used, we know that this phrase was often used in marriages in the pre-classical Greek era. And Hymen is, of course, the root word for the word him. I think that Whitman is, in fact, doing some very interesting things here with this poem. And uh, the first thing I want to point out at 3A is, uh, I'm sorry, at uh, 2B is, the repetitions uh, that we're going to play around with, because we're going to see a number of them. The word O gets used in this little uh, you know, four-line poem. The word O gets used four times, the word Y gets used four times, and we got five question marks. I think in some ways this is also a theodicy, a discussion of why there must be pain in the world. I think as well Whitman is definitely playing around with notions of inspiration. O Hymen, O Hymene. O Hymen, O Hymene, why do you tantalize me thus? Oh, why sting me for a swift moment only? Why can you not continue? Oh, why do you now cease? Is it because if you continued beyond the swift moment, you would soon certainly kill me? Now, this is a very interesting little poem on so many levels. I, I just want to point out the ways in which Whitman is constantly surprising us. For example, notice, O Hymen, O Hymene, why do you tantalize me? Would make sense, because then you would have that kind of internal rhyming going on. But no, no, he's going to end that first line with the word thus, and therefore he doesn't end with that predictable rhyme. Do you hear it? Do you see it, right? Now, obviously, we got a question here. That is to say, this goddess of marriage, right? Why do you tantalize me thus? Now, in some ways, the word tantalize is a fascinating word as it relates to leaves of grass. We'll pay attention to the ways in which there's like this desiring, this unavoidable desiring that we're going to always see playing out in these poems. His question, of course, is a question that can be read sexually, but can also be read in terms of inspirationally. That is to say, why is it the case that there's a certain kind of tantalizing of an idea that seems to kind of run away? Oh, why sting me? I told you guys that he loves this word sting. We'll see it several times in Lisa Grass. For a swift, brief moment only. He loves that idea of the brief, the brevity of certain kinds of moments. Like, the question here is, why is it that you're afraid to be with me. Now, obviously, this can be a sexual rendering, but it can also be an inspirational kind of understanding as well. Artists always are asking that question. And I think, quite frankly, much of this poem, standing behind much of this poem at 3A, is actually Percy Bysshe Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. We've commented a number of times, obviously, on the importance of that poem as it relates to the leaves of grass. And obviously, we've as well lectured it at Bernstrung.net. Notice the question is almost a theodicy question. Why must there be this kind of tantalizing? Why must there be this 
only a brief moment. In other words, it's the theodicy question. Why must there be pain? Why can you not continue? In other words, what is the reticence? What is it that's keeping you from being able to participate with me more than just a swift moment? Why do you now cease? Notice the immediacy of the question. What, where, where are you, in other words? And then, he be, and then he ends with a really interesting rhetorical question. Is it because if you continued, we would assume if we're reading sexually, this is to say overwhelmed sexually, this could be inspirationally overwhelmed. If you continued beyond the swift moment, we're back to the, to the uh, swiftness of, of a moment right from the second line, you would soon certainly kill me? Now, it's a violent image at the end, this kill, right? That is to say, what does he mean by this? Does he mean what he said earlier when we were messing around in Song of Myself, to, to touch my body to another's is about as much as I can stand. That idea, I don't know if I can sustain this level of erotics, ex, kind of maybe ecstasy, we might say, or inspirational ecstasy, if you, leave, if you read the poem, not as quite literal but metaphoric, right? Well, at 2A, obviously, he's going to make the argument that physical love is, in fact, spiritual love. They are symbiotic, right? They go together. At 2B, obviously, we've got these really interesting repetitions of O, oh, and then obviously four of them, and why we got four of them, and then obviously the question marks of five of them. At 3A, where are we going to relate uh, this back to? I think Whitman wants us to go back to our Homer, and I think he wants us to... Uh, as uh, in the Iliad, for example, the, what is the relationship between Zeus and Hera in the Iliad? Well, it's a fascinating one, and of course, it's one that kind of stands behind a poem, we might say, like a poem like this, or how about Homer's Odyssey, and the relationship between Odysseus, of course, and Penelope, and the ways in which there's a certain kind of tantalizing that happens there. I think that, I think Whitman's doing some pretty sophisticated stuff in a little poem like this. Of course, at 3B, we can ask the question, who or what tantalizes you in such a way as this? And if you're an artist at all, you have to play around with that game of the question. Why is it that inspiration seems to come and then it goes away, and it won't seem to stay for very long? I hope that our study here is at least tantalizing you and making you think a little bit about inspiration. Thank you.